Bonjour à tous et à toutes et bienvenue à cette séance du Festival Franco-Irlandais. C'est mon très, très grand plaisir de vous accueillir ici aujourd'hui où on va parler avec trois écrivains, Serge Joncourt, Elisha Grivna et Sarah Baum. Bienvenue. Serge Joncourt published his first novel, Vu, uh, in 1998. His novel, L'Idole, was given a big screen adaptation by Xavier Janoli and entered in the 2012 Venice Films Festival official competition. In 2016, his book, Repose-toi sur moi, won the Prix Interallier. More recently, his novel, Chien Loup, published in 2018, was awarded the Prix Landerneau des Lecteurs. Revenir, the film adapted from his novel, L'Amour sans le faire, was awarded Best Screenplay at the 2019 Venice Film Festival. And today we're going to speak most especially about his novel, Nature Humaine, published during the summer of 2020, so in the middle of the pandemic. And this book traces the changes of the last 30 years before the year 2000 from the point of view of a herding family in, in, the, in the lot. He won the Prix Femina for, for this novel in November 2020. Bienvenue, Serge Joncourt. Elish Ligrivna est l'auteur de plus de 25 romans, parmi lesquels The Dance is Dancing, The Shelter of Neighbors, A Fox Swallow Scarecrow. Ses récentes publications incluent l'autobiographie 12,000 Days, a memoir, sélectionné pour le prix Michel Dion en 2020, et Little Red and Other Stories. De nombreux prix littéraires lui ont été décernés, notamment le Pen Award pour sa contribution remarquable au patrimoine littéraire irlandais, ainsi que le prix Hennessy Hall of Fame. À l'automne 2020, encore une fois pendant la pandémie, elle a obtenu le, la prestigieuse bourse Burns du Collège de Boston. Elle est membre d'Estoma et présidente de Folklore of Ireland Society. Le premier roman de Sarah Bohm, Spill, Simmer, Falter, Wither, a été sélectionnée pour le prix Costa du premier roman. Elle a remporté le Jeffrey Faber Memorial Prize et a été traduite dans plusieurs langues. En 2017, son deuxième roman, dans la baie fauve, a été sélectionné pour le prix Goldsmith. En 2020, Sarah Baum sort son premier livre non fictionnel, Handiwork. Elle vit sur la côte sud de l'Irlande et partage son temps entre l'art visuel et l'écriture. Bienvenue, Sarah. So welcome, everybody. We're here today to talk about animals and the role of animals in literature. And I suppose it would be fair to say, first of all, that the role of animals in society seems to have changed hugely over the past 20, 30 years, certainly over the span of Serge's novel. Um, my first question to you really is, what role do animals play in your writing? And I'm going to start with you, Eilish. When I heard that the theme was animals, I thought, oh my goodness, there are no animals in my uh, fiction or writing. But when I began to think about it and I went hunting for the animals, I found actually quite a lot of them all over the place. <laughs> um, so um, I've been using, I've, they, they crop up in various ways. The first way, it, the first way in which animals occur in my writing, I think is in the, in the most common way in kind of realistic fiction. Um, animals occur as part of the household um, that I'm talking about, that I'm writing about. So, and the animals which occur most frequently are, surprise, surprise, cats. And they, they're, they're, they're sometimes playing a, a part in the, in the plot, actually, when they, you know, get sick or need attention or whatever. They, draw, they drive the plot in one or two of my stories, I've noticed. Um, other ways in which they occur are um, when I um, write, draw on folklore themes um, to usually to counterpoint a, 
story or a story that I'm telling, which is a contemporary story about about um, modern people. Um, I, I sometimes counterpoint that with a legend or a folk tale. And I've done that. I think the example that I picked is in this uh, collection of stories called The Inland Ice, where I am. Um, there are stories about obsessive love, many, several stories, several short stories, mostly set in the now. But I interweave those stories with a folk tale um, known to folklorists as the search for the lost husband. And it's one of these um, stories where um, a human being is transformed into an animal by a spell which is broken at the end of the story usually beauty and the beast is the most is the one that we'll all know about in the in this case i the the story is about um a man who is um a goat for half the time and a man for half the time and um his his uh, his wife gets to choose um he asks which would you prefer me to be a goat during the night and a man during the day or a man at night and a goat during the day and she says, well, I'd like a bit of company at night. I'd like you to be a man during the night and to go during the, the day. And so it goes on. It's a it's a wonderful story. Um, and you can interpret it, of course, in many different ways. I mean, it occurs to me, well, uh, humans are animals, obviously. Um, I know that one of the interpretations um, of this kind of story is that um, men are more animal <laughs> than women and the civilizing influence of the, you know, the princess or the beautiful um, woman um, finally breaks the spell and the goat or the beast or whatever, you have, a dog, they often are as well, um, it becomes human the whole time uh, when they marry the princess. So um, I, I, I changed the ending of the, of the folk tale, I have to say. But yeah, so there's, there's that sort of way. And then the other way, I'd forgotten about it um, is that um, in my very first children's book, um, I have talking animals, which we see the uncommon cormorant. There are the cormorants having a cup of tea. So um, <laughs> um, in, 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 that, in that book, I, um, I suppose I conform to the very long tr old tradition of anthropomorphizing animals for a children's story. And there are other ways as well that I use them. Thank you, Elisha. Yeah, we'll come back to the anthropomorphization later. Um, Serge, dans votre roman uh, Nature Humaine, il y a beaucoup d'animaux, surtout les bovins, et on parle de maladies des, des bovins, de la vache folle, de. de la manière dans laquelle on, on traite les animaux de nos jours, le productivisme. Parlez-nous un peu de ce qui vous a poussé à écrire, au, 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 écrire le, ce roman, la nature humaine. Nature humaine. C'est justement euh, ce qui vient d'être dit, c'est que les, les humains sont aussi des animaux, enfin sont des mammifères. Et... D'une certaine façon, nature humaine, il n'y a pas d'un côté la, les humains et de l'autre la nature, englobant tout le reste du monde végétal, animal. Non, non, est, on, on est un élément du, du dispositif. Et ça, ça se voit en particulier les animaux. Alors souvent, bon, ben, on peut avoir un chat, un chien, un oiseau, mais il y a des... Mon personnage, lui, est éleveur de bovins, c'est-à-dire qu'il... Il vit au milieu de ces animaux et en vivant au milieu des animaux, il en connaît un peu les, les règles, les, les procédures d'ailleurs, qu'on redécouvre en ce moment même au travers de l'isolement, la, la quarantaine, la mise en quarantaine. Tout ça, ce sont des choses qui sont courantes dans l'élevage. Quand on, on amène une vache d'un autre élevage, on l'amène chez soi, on la met d'abord en quarantaine. Enfin, il y a des, et d'une certaine façon, depuis un an, on redécouvre un peu cette, cette forme de... D'ailleurs, ce qu'on vise tous, tous les pays en ce moment, 
c'est ce qu'on appelle l'immunité de troupeau. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a un moment, il y aura suffisamment de personnes immunisées pour éteindre l'épidémie. Ben, on, on parle de troupeau, j'entendais ce matin à la radio un éminent euh, épidémiologiste qui avait ce mot-là, troupeau, et à un moment le journaliste le reprend, dit, troupeau, vous êtes sûr Ben oui, c'est comme ça que ça s'appelle. Et, et j'ai remarqué dans votre roman qu'il qu y a ce décalage entre euh, la, la vie urbaine et la vie campagnarde. Est-ce que vous trouvez que ce décalage a créé une mentalité urbaine qui permet aux gens de faire mal aux, aux, aux animaux D'une certaine façon, en milieu urbain, on est un peu déconnecté de... Là, en ce moment, là, je, je suis à la campagne et le matin, ce qui domine, c'est la multitude de chants d'oiseaux chardonnay, des fauvettes, des pies, des jets, ça n'arrête pas, les, les écureuils qui se cavalent encore, les chevreuils qui toute la nuit euh, ont cherché leur partenaire, les sangliers qui ont cherché à manger en descendant euh, dans la vallée. Donc le, le matin, c'est comme si euh, vous entriez sur scène, sur un théâtre dans, dans lequel pendant la nuit s'est jouée une pièce, et dont les humains étaient absents. Et, et la nuit, il y a des tas de bruits comme ça qui peuvent paraître euh, totalement allégoriques, fous et inquiétants, mais c'est simplement que ces animaux sont là, ils vivent leur vie. Euh. Bon, ben ça, évidemment, en, en milieu urbain, on ne on le, on le voit pas. Donc, il y a une vraie... Et en même temps, le territoire urbain occupe une infime partie du, du territoire de, de, de notre planète. Quoi. Donc, il y a un moment, et ça je le notais en même temps euh, au travers de la littérature, euh, euh, il, y a, il y a toute une littérature urbaine. En fait, pour moi, il y a une littérature du, du dehors et une littérature urbaine. Hein. Alors, quand on veut faire chic en France, on, on parle de « nature writing » en disant. D'ailleurs, il n'y a pas d'équivalent en français nature writing, l'écriture de la nature. Mais on le laisse un peu aux Américains, ça. En se disant, finalement, eux, ils ont de l'espace. Vous voyez, moi, mon personnage, c'est un éleveur de, de bovins, on pourrait dire c'est un, un cow-boy. Ça, ça serait plus chic. Et cet univers-là, ce, ce dehors, cette campagne, on la redécouvre. Là, de la même façon, depuis un an, où on a tous plus ou moins maintenant le rêve d'y vivre à la campagne. On parle, en tout cas en France, de, de dizaines, de centaines de milliers de citadins qui cherchent une maison à la campagne. Donc il y a quand même un retour à la, à la nature. Donc il y a cette période qu'on vit depuis un an, c'est quand même une sorte de prodigieux rappel à, à l'ordre, que cette nature, elle est là, et que finalement, ce ne sont pas nous les plus forts c'est elle et qu'on est soumis à ses règles. Voilà. Alors ça, oui, pardon, pardon je l'ai écrit en, sans l'arrière-pensée de ce qu'on allait vivre en ce moment, et bien évidemment, mais il n'empêche que quand je mets en scène les premières pages, c'est la sécheresse de 1976 qui a été très forte en France, ce qu'on on appelle ça une des canicules maintenant. Et en France, alors, en 1976, on disait « ça arrive une fois tous les 100 ans, qu'il fasse très chaud, qu'il n'y ait plus d'eau. » Et finalement, aujourd'hui, ça arrive tous les ans. Donc, il y a quand même une modification aussi. De... Je voulais mettre ça en perspective parce que ces 40 dernières années, il y a une forme d'accélération de tout un tas de processus qu'on ne maîtrise pas. Et voilà, plutôt que dans d'en faire un énième rapport ou un essai, je voulais le, le montrer de façon concrète et, et humaine et ressentie à travers de, de, mes, de mes personnages. Merci. Je passe maintenant à Sarah, Sarah Baum. I'm, I'm going to ask, ask Sarah about animals in your writing because I, I, know, I know that to date, 
every single one of your works has been permeated by an engagement with with the animal world. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, totally unlike Ailish, um, as soon as I saw the topic for this panel, I was like, yes, this is like my specialized subject. <laughs> um, but also like Ailish, I can't say that I've made a conscious effort to put animals in everything I've written so far, um, that they're there because they have more of a presence in my life um, than humans. And um, just like what Serge was saying, really, in the last year, that's been even more acute because um, I see far more animals on a daily basis than I do people. Um, so yeah, my first novel, um, I, I tend to call it now my monologue to dog. Um, so the entire thing is written in second person and it's uh, spoken from the point of view of a man to his dog. Um, so uh, that put me firmly in the bracket of, of animal literature. Um, and then my second novel is interspersed with um, photographs of roadkill. I shouldn't call it roadkill, really, because they're more so dead animals, dead birds. Um, some of them have, have been hit by vehicles. Some of them haven't. Um, and they uh, there's 10 chapters and each chapter is named for an animal. And a photograph of the dead animal appears somewhere in each chapter for the chapter that it's named for. Um, and then my most recent book, Handiwork, which is nonfiction, um, is, uh, is it's, it's about uh, this insistence that I've always felt to work with my hands. So it's about um, handicraft, essentially, and about uh, making artwork or trying to make artwork. But um, it's as much about um, bird migration. Um, and really the genesis for it was when I found a connection between a couple of different subjects, but the main ones being um, the work of the hands and and birds and their migration. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I can't seem to escape the animals no matter how hard I try. Um, I loved what Serge was saying as well about, um, about how they sort of, uh, they have this whole theatre going on at night um, that we're not aware of. We just see the traces of it in the morning um, because I'm out in the countryside as well and we, um, we hear foxes quite a lot, even though it took me ages to realise they were foxes because they make this most, it's like it's somewhere between an, an, a duck and an alien um, I think it's vixens and I think it's when they're on heat. Um, but the, the screams that they make and it, it brings, you know, it, it, it really recreates for me what it must have been like um, years ago when we uh, when we had, you know, fairies and banshees. And it totally explains to you where all of these stories from mythology came from. So the animal world is informing the, the fairy tales. So you think the fairy tales have been written by or, or composed, I suppose, narrated by people who've been informed by, by the world around them. Well, well, I mean, I think they were explaining, um, explaining sort of, you know, scientific um, or, or sources, such as the noise of a fox or the noise of an owl. Um, and because they had, because it was such, such a peculiar noise, um, of course, it was attributed to something, a spiritual being, you know, a, um, a ghost or a fairy or something. I mean, the seals is the classic one. And uh, the first time I heard seal babies, um, seal pups um, crying out, I don't know if it's something any of you have heard. Um, but like, I literally, my partner and I nearly walked off a cliff because we thought that there was a child down there shouting. Um, and even though this was coming from people who, who knew that seals could often sound human, um, who'd lived by the sea for years, and we were still that convinced. We couldn't believe that it wasn't a person crying. Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, that's, I'm really interested in all that. Yeah, I, I'll just come in there because that really is interesting. It is, it is offered as one of the explanations for the belief in the Banshee, uh, by the folk as well, that it's really the cry of the vixen fox, just as you described it. It does sound like a banshee squealing. And um, you'd be interested maybe to know that there are um, legends about talking seals. Um, Peg, the famous Peg Sayers, uh, tells one of them about Sean O'Shea, Agus Unrown, and it's about... Um, a seal who talks to a man it's one of these stories where it's a real animal it's not an anthropomorphized animal it's a seal in a cave down in Dunquin or somewhere and um, um, it asks the man not to not to kill it and and he does that he 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 obeys the request of the seal so um uh, as 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 we were saying um I think in the past, and maybe sometimes in the present, if you live in the country, people were so close to animals, much closer than we are in, in the urban environment today. So um, that kind of interaction with, with, with real animals um, was just there. And 
Yeah, I've got little trees. Oh, yeah. right. No, I was just like, I wondered actually about the banshee because um, cause the, 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 there's owls as well that we don't hear as often, but I wondered, was it an owl or was it a vixen? So that's interesting to know it's it's the vixen. Well, it, well it, it, yeah, well, it, 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 it could have been the vixen, the it could have been an owl, it could have been the banshee. If I <laughs> so, so, so what you're saying in a sense is that literature helps make sense of the world. That the storytelling is 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 giving an explanation to to things that people people can't quite comprehend otherwise. Yes, yeah, of course. I mean, this is steeped in our tradition as well, obviously. So, Eilish, I want you to go back to the anthropomorphization of animals. I, I I look at children's books nowadays, and they're very very different from the from the fables that you and I would have studied at, at school. Um, I I see my niece wanting, you know, a pink unicorn. Uh, is this Disneyfication of animals something to be concerned about? And I'll pass to Serge afterwards to ask you about children and animals. Um, yeah, I don't know if, it, I mean, I would say that um, my little pony thing and the the, uni the pink and silver unicorns and so on, um, and the attraction they have for children is an effect of market forces. But the uh, this anthropomorphization of animals for in stories for children is ancient, and um, you know the Aesopic fables um, that six sixth century BC Aesop is supposed to have lived, um, and right through uh, history through the Middle Ages and um, up to the present day, um, there is uh, seems to be there's this idea that children like um, you know talking animals and stories about animals. So um, and uh, so so and they do. I think I think that's true. Um, uh, when um, I've been telling a story, writing a story for, during the pandemic because I can't see my grandchildren, um, especially since they live in America. Um, I've been uh, writing a story which started off with a grim story about the cat and the mouse which who set up house together. Um, and... Uh, well, to cut to cut this the story short anyway, but basically it's one of these stories, Britain and Dukas three hula and Kit, the cat the cat, surprise, surprise, does what cats do. And at the end of the story, he eats she she eats the mouse. Um so so um the, there's a moral in it. If you're a mouse, you shouldn't actually start uh, housekeeping with a cat. But um, and my grandchild loved this story, you know, the five-year-old grandchild. Um, so and I continued on with these characters, um, Patrick Mouse and Porcine Cat, and they've assembled a lot of friends, some humans, some animal, and so on. So there seemed to be a kind of an instinctive um drive in me to when I'm telling a story to kids that I'm going to have uh, a lot of animals in it and they're going to behave like humans so the Disney thing is really a, a reflection of that it is just a continuation it's a continuation of it I mean obviously taking everything into account the the, the, the it, it is a I would see it as a continuation of it yeah now the unicorn is interesting of course in another way um, because of the logical creature and there are no unicorns. <laughs> but um, I think that kind of, you know, imagining a sort of creature which actually does not exist is is also a very ancient thing. Um, there is um, a writer I like a lot, uh, Henning Manke, the writer of detective stories uh, in Swedish, uh, who, who died a couple of years ago, um, has a wonderful essay about um, a figure called the Lion Man. Um, this is a little wooden figurine, which was um, which is thirty thousand years old and was dug up in Germany, I think, in nineteen thirty eight. So we didn't hear too much about it for a while, for obvious reasons. But um, it's 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 um, the body of a man with the head of a lion. And Manco says um, this is an example of how the human imagination is beginning to work. Um, that you know, there, there there are no men with lions' heads. Um, so, um, but we can we can imagine that. Um, and 
you get that quite a lot in the folk tales. And I think that's fascinating as a kind of symbolical, metaphorical representation of what writers do. Serge, et pour vous, j'ai vu dans Nature Humaine que vous parlez, Alexandre parle de, de sa nièce et de la manière dans laquelle on, on traite l'enfant de nos jours. Et c'est pas comme dans le passé. N'est-ce pas? Comment on traite le? L'enfant. On bêtifie, on, on bêtifie l'enfant. La, la oui. vie. Euh... Oui, disons que enfin, lui, il est, il est resté à, 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 la, à la campagne et ses sœurs sont parties, ses trois sœurs sont parties à, en ville, hein, à Paris. Et, et effectivement, à partir de là, ils, ils sont plus, pour ainsi dire, ils sont plus sur la même planète et, et ils sont étonnés. Enfin, il, lui, il est étonné de les voir. Euh, bêtifié avec les, les deux gamins, les deux nouveau nés alors que de son côté, il y a une dizaine de veaux qui viennent de naître et qui, qui sont tout aussi merveilleux et spectaculaires. Bon. Et ça, c'est une façon de montrer que ses sœurs, en étant parties en ville, finalement euh, étaient devenues euh, indifférentes à, à tout ce qui fait sa vie, lui, et sachant que alors une ferme, évidemment, il y, a, il y a ces vaches, mais il y a bien sûr des chiens, pour, euh, des chiens qui sont en même temps des, 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 des compagnons, des ouvriers, on pourrait dire, des, qui, qui travaillent, enfin, qui font partie de, de la force de travail. Quoi. Et, et puis, bah, il y a tous les animaux autour dont je parlais. Et puis, il peut y avoir aussi les, les poules euh, qui font des œufs, parce que les poules, ce sont les poules qui font les œufs. Hein. Mais, il y a un moment, dans les années 90, en, en France, il y avait eu un un, un sondage fait dans les écoles primaires, on demandait aux enfants de dessiner des, des, des animaux. Et à un moment, on demandait de dessiner des poissons. Et il y en a 30% qui avaient dessiné des rectangles, qui sont des poissons surgelés. Et, et ça, une, ça m'avait marqué. <rire> ça semblait assez anecdotique, mais en fait, ça, ça disait bien à quel point. Et ça, ça rejoint un peu ce que disait Sarah euh, sur le bruit du renard, par exemple. On, si on ne sait pas que c'est un renard, on ne sait pas ce que c'est. C'est totalement terrifiant. Et c'est simplement une sorte de, de connaissance qu'on a perdue. Parce qu'il est bien évident que nos ancêtres, à, à nous quatre, euh, il y a un siècle et un peu plus, savaient très précisément à quel moment euh, le chevreuil aboyait, à quel moment c'était le renard, et à quel moment c'était autre chose. Quoi. Enfin, voilà. Cette partition-là, on l'a un, euh, un peu oubliée. Et, et c'est vrai, ce que vous disiez, Elise, c'est de, de, de certaine façon le, euh, la mythologie, euh, les contes, euh, y compris Walt Disney, c'est une façon de recréer ce monde-là euh, artificiel, hein. alors qu'en fait, il est toujours là. Enfin, je veux dire, il est... Il suffit de s'y perdre un peu, et ils sont tous là. En tout cas, pour ce qui est de, de nos contrées, ça sent que, alors là, après, ça sera un autre débat, c'est sur la, la perte de biodiversité qui fait que certaines espèces euh, disparaissent. Hein. Mais enfin, bon, pour ce qui est de, de nos contrées, alors moi, je vois, je suis un peu attentif, il y a des, des insectes, il y en a beaucoup, enfin, il y en avait beaucoup l'année dernière, à un moment, il y a deux, trois ans, on se disait, tiens, il n'y a plus d'insectes, il n'y a plus d'abeilles, il n'y a, a plus de papillons. Bon, ben, l'année dernière, on avait plein. Bon, ben, cette année, j'attends un peu de voir ce qui lancera des forces en présence. Quoi. Si la pandémie a, a contribué un peu à sauver la planète. <rire> Ça, c'est une, une question. Mais en, en tout cas, il y a quelque chose qui me semble tout à fait spectaculaire, même quand on est dans un endroit un peu reculé. Ici, ça s'appelle le triangle noir. C'est une zone en France où il n'y a pas de pollution lumineuse la nuit, il n'y a pas de ville. Donc, on voit les étoiles. Donc, on euh, c'est habitué à regarder en haut. Et en général, quand on regarde la nuit en haut, on voit, parce que Toulouse n'est pas loin, enfin, une centaine de kilomètres, il y a, il y a beaucoup d'avions quand même. Et là, 
Hier soir, je, je regardais le ciel comme ça et j'ai été surpris de voir très haut une lumière. J'ai eu pendant deux secondes le, le réflexe de me dire « mais qu'est-ce que c'est ?» J'avais enfin, Mais vraiment, ça a duré deux secondes, mais j'avais oublié. On n'en voit plus. De, de, on ne voit plus d'avions. Alors, je ne sais pas si le fait qu'il y ait moins d'avions fera qu'il y aura plus d'insectes. Je ne suis pas sûr. Mais il y a quand même des modifications qui ont été à l'œuvre. Et, et ça se joue en très peu de temps. Il me semble qu'en un an, il peut y avoir un, un vrai retentissement. Oui. Sarah, you, you have insects occurring, in, occurring repeatedly throughout some of your work. And you live in the countryside. Do you see a difference Now, do you see a, an increase in, in insect life since the beginning of the pandemic? Was that me? Yes. yes. Sarah? Yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, it's interesting what Serge was saying. Like, is, were there more butterflies last year? Is it a case that, um, like I know, say here in the case of Birdwatch Ireland, many, many more people are looking at, at, at birds and insect species and participating in surveys or say registering on websites like biodiversity.ie which um so you know so is it a case that um that that nature has improved slightly in some case or in some um uh it, for some species or is it a case that human behavior has changed and that that's reflected upon our perception of it um because definitely with everything that i write it's sort of about and with everything that i've The animal literature that I've studied, um, it, it, it's always a case of um, a human perspective being bounced through an animal perspective. Um, like, uh, this is a slight misquote, but Immanuel Kant said something like, you can judge the heart of man by the way he treats a harmless animal. Um, and so that's what, um, uh, so yeah, sorry, that just popped into my head when when, when you were talking about the butterflies. Um, but yeah, in terms of bio, I, like, I, I really don't know whether Um, I, I know that that everyone's paying more attention to it, but and it's something that I'm aware of. But I haven't lived here all that long, so I think unless you've lived in a place for 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 many generations, you can't really reflect on the changes in it. Elish, do you think we've been talking about you know, quite serious things like the pandemic and the the erosion of species, um, global warming, and the impact that's having on on, on insects and by extension of, you know, everything's interconnected. So by extension, the whole planet can suffer as a result. Do you think the writer has uh, any obligation to to write about these subjects? Well, that's a big question. Um, um, you know, writers, is it Socrates who says the writer should be a gadfly in the height of the state? But I feel that responsibility or task has been taken on by journalists um, and that writers in, let's talk about Ireland, um, tend to um, issue any kind of um, responsibility to society or to um politics or ideologies and are a little bit afraid of that you know I think you often hear an Irish writer quoting a line by John McGarhan a writer's uh, only business is to mind his sentences which seems to be saying that your only duty as a writer is to write well to take care of the style and so on which I personally think is absolute rubbish <laughs> um, I think okay, that's part of it. Of course, you have to write well and beautifully and as perfectly as you can in using the language that you're using, but you also are saying something. And um, so, and you get, I think you get quite a different way of attitude from writers in, say, Eastern Europe. So I'm kind of interested in Bulgaria for the last several years. And, you, you know, you find in countries like Bulgaria that the writing is quite different and it's much more uh, concerned with the state and with how the individual survives um, in communism or in a corrupt state or whatever. Um, so so I, I kind of feel that the individualism that we're devoted to in in Ireland and in America, really, um, is, is kind of a bit of a luxury, really, that you have if you live in a rather stable um, and, and rich country, even if the writers are not rich themselves, there's that sort of stability which allows that art for art's sake. Um, and now we don't live in a stable world. And 
that's something the pandemic certainly should have taught us. Um, I mean, I feel that the pandemic is a result of the it is a result of the of, of environmental issues. The kind of thing Greta Thunberg. We haven't heard too much from Greta during the pandemic because she's gone back to school. But that child activist, um, you know, was talking about how we travel too much and so on. So now we don't we don't see the planes in the sky. I mean, I was one of the worst offenders. I love flying about the place, etc. But that's what got the virus from Wuhan to the rest of the world in no time at all sort of thing. So I feel we don't live in that stable environment anymore. And I think it's unavoidable um, for, for writers to engage with um, with with environmental issues from now on. I, I, I think it's just going to be there. Maybe even if it's only like the cats in my stories, they kind of happen to be there. Um, now the environment and what we're doing with it will certainly be there, even if you're not going head on. I mean, I do think fiction, which is what I mostly write, is primarily about people, characters engaged in life and that's what it's about. It, it has to be about um, about um, human individuals um, in the midst of um, some sort of psychological crisis. Or it, it always is one way or the other. But I think the setting for it is going to be changing all the time. And that now it is going to involve um, environmental issues. So I think could I just, just, um, yes. No, sorry, can I just chip in there? Because um, I think there's definitely this, um, I mean, I know my own books have been talked about in the context of um, eco-criticism or eco-fictions, you know, which certainly wasn't a term that I was aware of when I was writing the novels anyway. Um, but it's interesting that, um, well, you know, from my own personal point of view, these are issues that I'm concerned about. They're the material of my life, you know. Um, and so when I became interested in birds, you can't, you know, you can't, go and watch for birds unless you're also aware of the fact that there are less of them you know um you can hear the cry of a curlew but it's sort of tinged with sadness because you know they're disappearing um so i never like i would never want to um want to have a political agenda in my books but um but it's you know it's the old the personal is political if you care about something enough and if you make that connection um then it will come through and hopefully other people will um you know even if they just gain an awareness of um of of this small bird called the northern wheat here who I sort of became obsessed with and then it, it triggered um, it triggered the, the material for my book. Um, so I think it's definitely, it comes to the fore because it's, you know, because it's important, it's there at the moment. Serge, vous avez parlé hier des rapports scientifiques et de l'influence ou manque d'influence des, des rapports des scientifiques. Uh, Quel est votre rôle en tant qu'écrivain de nos jours C'est peut-être justement de... Ben, ben voilà, de... en faisant ce roman, je voulais faire un, un tableau de l'histoire récente sur les 40 dernières années et montrer le, le changement de regard, ne serait-ce que sur ces vagues de chaleur. Euh, et en même temps, remettre en tête des épisodes oubliés comme celui de la vache folle une maladie qui venait de la enfin qui venait en mangeant du bœuf mais enfin c'est une maladie qu'on a transmise nous humains aux animaux en leur faisant manger des, des farines animales pas assez cuites c'est-à-dire en, en, en donnant de la viande à manger à des herbivores Ce qui est, totalement fou. Bon, ben, tout ça, c'est des épisodes qu'on vit, qu'on traverse, comme la tempête de 99 en France qui a été très violente et qui a mis à terre des, des centaines de milliers d'hectares de forêts qui étaient comme ça pulvérisées. Et c'est pas si vieux que ça, mais c'est déjà oublié. Et De la même façon, Tchernobyl et d'autres épisodes que j'ai sélectionnés dans ce roman. Bon. Ben, moi, mon, ce que j'avais envie de faire, en tout cas, c'est une mission que je m'assigne, 
au moins à moi, c'est de remettre en scène ces, ces événements-là, les remettre en tête, euh, l'émergence du, du sida aussi, parce que le sida qui était très présent dans les esprits dans les années 80-90, il est presque oublié, comme s'il n'existait plus, alors que pas fini, c'est une épidémie qui n'est pas contrôlée. Enfin, qui est... En tout cas, il n'y a toujours pas de vaccin pour le sida, donc c'est un problème actuel encore. Et... Voilà, j'avais envie d'attirer de... l'attention sur tout ça, en montrant que ce n'était pas réglé, que ce n'était pas... pas terminé, et d'une certaine façon, il fallait, ben, il fallait veiller à... Alors, sur, les... sur la nourriture des sur les farines animales, je, il semblerait qu'il y en a encore. Certains aient repris, je ne sais pas où ça en est précisément, mais ça serait bien de s'y intéresser quand même. Et puis aussi sur cette façon euh, incessante de, de voyager. Moi, mon personnage, il refuse de prendre l'avion et il se coupe de son environnement et de, de la jeune femme qu'il rencontre qui, elle, veut courir le monde. Donc, euh, ça ne marche pas quelque part. Ils sont inconciliables. Il bon ben, y a un moment, on se posait cette question-là. Est-ce que c'est euh, normal d'être là, en Irlande, ou en France, et puis dans 12 heures, d'être au fin fond de la forêt amazonienne avec 40 degrés, taux d'humidité à 80% et des tas d'insectes que, que notre peau n'a jamais rencontrés Ça me semble pas sain. D'ailleurs, c'est aussi dans le... Dans le roman, ça c'est le grand-père qui le dit au fils, quand tu achètes une bête d'un autre élevage, quand on achète la bête, on achète la maladie. C'est-à-dire quand on fait venir la bête. Bon, ben, ce qui s'est passé, c'est un peu ça, la, la, cette mondialisation euh, excessive fait que tout s'emballe très vite. Quoi. Ce coronavirus, il aurait pu se limiter à une, à une zone limitée, comme le SRAS, euh, le premier, le SRAS-1, le MERS, et les des épidémies comme ça qui partaient, qui ont été finalement euh, jubilées. Bon, ben, là, c'est de fait, notre schéma de, de fonctionnement fait que à tout moment, et je pense que ce n'est pas fini, parce que des, euh, au sud de la France, il y a des moustiques-tigres qui sont porteurs de la dengue, le chikungunya, qui sont des, des maladies qu'on attrapait uniquement en Amazonie ou en Afrique. Euh, on est rentré dans ce processus-là. Donc, il y a un moment, c'est au moins de... Alors là, la réalité nous a tous rattrapés. Cette prise de conscience, on, on y est tous soumis, mais j'ai peur que dans un an, on est complètement oublié. Il faudra écrire un livre sur le, la Covid-19 pour, pour se dire « Ah oui, tiens, en fait !» Et ça, ça m'affole. Cette faculté d'oublier, elle, elle est terrifiante. Et, et vous, tant qu'écrivain, avez-vous un rôle est-ce que, est est que ce sera vous et, et, et les autres auteurs à, à sauver la vie en Quel cas, rôle à, comme... à vos mots <rire> Comme je peux l'avoir dans mon environnement proche ou familial, dire il ne faut pas oublier la tempête de 99, il ne faut pas trouver normal d'avoir une canicule à 40 degrés tous les, tous les étés. Bon, ben, un, un écrivain le fait avec un environnement peut-être un peu plus large euh, que simplement sa famille, mais enfin, ça revient un peu à ça, c'est attirer l'attention. Après, changer les comportements, ça, vous savez, un... en fait, ce qui change les comportements, c'est le réel. C'est-à-dire, quand on... une fois qu'on est le nez, dans le... le nez dans la crise, c'est là qu'on réagit. Quoi. Donc, je ne suis pas sûr que les écrivains puissent empêcher les crises, hein, mais... mais en tout cas, les mettre en scène et, et essayer d'en comprendre un peu le déroulé. Et d'une façon... Euh concrète, sensible, parce que parfois, euh, toutes les informations qu'on peut avoir sur le, les rapports du GIEC, le réchauffement climatique, font que ça n'est pas incarné. Et, et tous les jours, on a des rappels à l'ordre hein, sur le réchauffement climatique, etc. Alors, il y a ceux qui n'y croient pas, évidemment, bon, comme toujours, hein, euh, les sceptiques. Quoi. Et, et puis, parfois, ça semble trop abstrait, alors que c'est par la sensation qu'on... Ce que recrée là, un écrivain, c'est des sensations chez, chez l'autre. Bon, ben là, on est tous dépassés là, en tant qu'écrivain par le réel, parce que cette sensation, on la ressent tous. Là. Cette peur d'un virus, cette peur de tomber malade, on la ressent tous. Quoi. Mais un roman, euh, le mien, quel qu'il soit, c'est aussi de recréer des sensations. 
Sarah, what's your role in this? Sarah, what, what's your role in this? Yeah, well, it's funny. Um, I was very much influenced by um, Animal Farm when I was a teenager. Um, it was one of the first sort of, you know, adult books that I'd read. I remember that having a big effect on me. And I'm, I'm constantly kind of moving the pieces around in my head and thinking, how do you write a contemporary Animal Farm that's such a perfect metaphor for, you know, how humans mistreat well, I mean, really, it was nothing to do with how how humans mistreat um, nature, but it's kind of what it's it's the issue at hand now. Whereas, whereas back then it was um, totalitarianism or whatever. Um, but uh, but it's funny, like I, I've each more or less um, touched on this already, in that it's journalists now who bring us the news and tell us what we should do or what we could do. Um, whereas the role of the writer is to to move people to actually act, you know, um, to tell them the human stories or the <laughs> animal stories, as the case may be. Um, and like, um, just, I mean, it popped into my head because I'm reading at the moment um, Ocean Vuong, the um, American Vietnamese poet slash writer's um, memoir slash novel um, that is, you know, very personal and about his life now. And he's, um, I mean, younger than me even, but it's, it's also very much about the legacy of the Vietnam War. Um, so uh, to tap into what Serge was saying, you know, and um, we can continue to tell these stories. And I think it's our role as writers to, to tell them in a way that moves people, that actually holds their attention. Um, because there's so much, you know, journalists just shoot stuff at us constantly and we sort of glaze over a bit. Um, so I think, I think there's a responsibility, but it's like the worst thing you can do is try um, because then you'll just slip into journalistic mode and it will lose its, its heart, you know. Elish? Yes, absolutely. I agree with totally with Serge and Sarah. I think um, our job as creative writers is um, to be concrete, um, get away from the abstraction of the statistics and um, to, and, and, and to write about feelings. And yeah, I mean, we hear, you know, 20 people died. It's not that it means nothing, but it doesn't mean an awful lot. But if one person in your own life dies, um, that means a huge amount. And if um, in, in your writing you fo focus on um, an individual who is affected profoundly and deeply by whatever, the, let's say the, let's say COVID, um, that is what um, can have an effect on, 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 on other people who are reading the work. So yeah, that, 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 that is the role of, of the writer, I think. It's, I, isn't there something about Balzac's horse that like the horror of war, okay, but we, we, we don't like war, we are concerned about, we, we, empathize, we sympathize with um, people who are dead and killed and destroyed. Um, but if you focus just on one horse who has died during the war, that that's what ar can arouse the sympathy of the reader. Um, and I think that's where we still are. So yeah, that, 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 that's how we'll have to do it. Um, and I, I also think there is something to what Serge says that we have very short, people have very short memories and, um, you know, we're all dying to get out of this pandemic, to get the vaccine, it'll be over and it will be lovely to kind of forget about it, but, um, but, but perhaps it is um, the role of the writer to remind people, yeah, and, and, and to, to, to keep, keep the memory of alive as a sort of a warning, I guess, because it's going to happen again. Serge, <coughs> quels sont vos espoirs pour le, pour le futur des animaux? Les êtres humains compris. <laughs> Mon espoir sur, les, sur le sort des animaux. Et, et, et nous compris. <laughs> <laughs> Il est, il est lié. C est, c est, c est, on n'est pas dissocié des, des, des animaux. Et, et ça, c'est l'occasion de, de se rappeler que la, la chauve-souris est un mammifère, comme nous. On est un peu de la même famille. Ça, ce qui semble, ça semble très loin une chauve-souris. Mais il n'empêche qu'on est du même règne, quoi. Et, Bon, ben voilà, et, et moi je suis attentif aussi. À... Il y a un problème avec les moustiques parce que bon, je trouve qu'il y en a de plus en plus. Mais ben, 
Vous savez, vous êtes une assemblée là, le soir, à manger dehors. Assez... Il suffit de, d'un moustique pour foutre le bazar et empêcher tout le monde de dormir, finalement. Bon, ben, un moustique, c'était un film. Quoi. Non, mais... Tout ça, il faut... c'est une sorte de négociation avec cet environnement-là. Il faut retrouver une forme de, de, de paix, quoi, de, d'harmonie. Quoi. Donc, notre sort, il est lié aussi à au sort de ces, de ces animaux, tout simplement parce qu'on on en est un hein, animal. Sarah, what's your hope as, a, as, a, as an author for the animal world, human beings? Um, as an author? <laughs> uh, maybe someone else will write that, that contemporary version of Animal Farm so that I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I think I think there has to be less less humans and more animals going into the future. Um, and I think that people of my age and younger will will have less children. To be honest, I think that's um, um, that's something we'll see in the future, and that would be my hope. Um, on a lighter note, I've been I've been laughing at people getting puppies on Instagram during the pandemic um, because uh, I've never I've never le- le- wanted to have puppies less <laughs> than during the pandemic. It's like I've been stuck at home with my dogs for an entire year, and they drive you up the walls. So. <laughs> So my own personal future is less pets. <laughs> less pets, less humans, more animals. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've, we've covered so much this, this morning. We've, we've talked about climate change. We've talked about man's interaction with an animal, uh, with the animal world. We've talked about moral responsibilities of authors and of society vis-a-vis animals and vis-a-vis each other. Uh, All all I can say is that it's been an incredibly thought-provoking session. Um, I'm extremely grateful to you all. Un grand merci à Serge Jancourt, Elish Nigrevna et Sarah Baum. Thank you so much. So please stay with us because we'll have a reading now by by the great Northern Irish poet Michael Longley. Restez avec nous parce qu'on va maintenant avoir une lecture de poésie du grand poète nord-irlandais Michael Longley. Et n'oubliez pas que le prochain panel est à midi et s'intitule The End of Worlds. And don't forget to join us for our next panel, which is at midday and which is entitled The End of Worlds. Thank you.